Good day to you once again and welcome to Longevity Now, the place to get all your news and views about life extension from around the world. We often discuss the practical aspects of healthy living during this broadcast. Eating right, getting some exercise, and watching your health closely, generally speaking, will increase the odds that you're going to live long enough to benefit from more advanced disease treatments and future rejuvenation therapies, thus avoiding the painful and debilitating aspects of aging. This interview focuses on a particular diet and lifestyle. It's called the Primal Blueprint, sometimes referred to as the Paleo Diet, and one of the leading proponents is Mark Sisson, who has helped literally thousands of people shed weight, get in shape, and feel good about their health once again. Listen in to find out more about this particular style of healthy living. And now I would like to welcome to this podcast, Mr. Mark Sisson. Hello, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Justin. How are you? Well, everything is going just great, hopefully on the way to getting a lot of new information about uh, health and nutrition today. Uh, just for the benefit of new listeners, uh, could you please give us a, a brief history of how you got started on the primal lifestyle uh, in particular? Was it a gradual change throughout your life, or was there a defining moment that kind of thrust you into a new direction for health? Oh, I, I think it was uh, an evolution uh, I was an endurance athlete in the late 70s, and I was eating a very complex carbohydrate-based diet, was racing well, but was very sick on the inside as a result of the inflammatory nature of not only the training I was doing, but the, the diet that I was eating to fuel all of the training miles. So when the wheels came off, literally, uh, at the age of 28 or 29, I sort of vowed to find ways to be fit and strong and lean and healthy. Uh, all at the same time with the least amount of sacrifice and suffering and pain. And that really led me to start doing research for the first 25 years into evolutionary biology and then uh, starting about 10 years ago into genetic science. And with gene mapping, we started to see all of the power that we had to literally be able to, to find these hidden genetic switches that we could control through the foods we ate or the types of exercise we chose to do. And that's really in the last 10 years where this has all kind of come together in a okay. very empowering life way. All right. Uh, and you've helped a lot of people through your seminars and your blog right. and your books achieve uh, more optimum health. What's, what's the toughest thing people encounter when attempting primal nutrition in their lifestyle? Well, the toughest thing is probably giving up the grains. Uh -huh. And we're pretty adamant about that. I think that uh, the nature of our digestive tracts is that we should be eating plants and animals. And those, the plants that are not included would be uh, grains and legumes. So I think if you can understand that you can eat all you want from a list that contains meat, fish, fowl, eggs, nuts, seeds, vegetables, and a little bit of fruit, the idea that you have to give up grains, which include cereals and breads and pastas and things like that, isn't quite so daunting. But it's still a tough one for people mm. to, to give up their cereals and their sandwiches and things like that. It's just there are a lot of reasons why grains are probably the, the, the worst thing that you could base a diet on. Sure. And that kind of leads me into a question I had in mind. Uh, many people besides yourself have advocated limiting the high GI carbs and grains from the diet and really have in achieved extraordinary results. And if you go back to Atkins, it's been at least a couple of decades uh, of success in, in health and nutrition, yet most American diets still have an abundance of carbs. There's still, you know, an obesity epidemic and a diabetes epidemic. What's the main obstacle to tipping the scales toward better overall food consumption uh, on the societal level, let's say? Some people say, you know, it's agribusiness. Some people say it's government subsidies for bad food. Maybe it's just that the sugary things are addictive. Uh, what do you think? I mean, I think that's probably it. I think that this isn't, we shouldn't necessarily blame agribusiness or, or uh, faulty government policy making. I mean, ultimately, this is about choices. And, and really, there are no right or wrong choices. There are just choices. And I'm happening to espouse one that I think will lead to the greatest amount of health and fitness and happiness possible. But it does get back to the fact that our brains are hardwired to seek out things that are sweet. And when we surround ourselves with all these sweet things, we tend to sabotage our uh, attempts to lose body fat. Uh, I mean, compounding the issue is the fact that virtually every every type of grain that you consume converts very readily in the GI tract and then gets into the bloodstream as glucose. And so the, the brain doesn't know whether the glucose that's in your bloodstream right now came from a bowl of sugar, uh, a Snickers bar, or uh, a slice of bread. And when we continually present these forms of glucose 
to our bodies, these high-carb loads that increase the amount of glucose uh, and wreak havoc with our appetites and our reward centers, we are going to encounter the problems. So it really still remains incumbent upon us to cut back on these refined carbohydrate sources. Okay. And just a couple of questions here, uh, a little more specific about uh, certain types of food uh, that I know have been debated through the years. Uh, while reading a recent blog post about the growth of your son, you mentioned switching from regular mass-produced food to organic food. What's your opinion on that uh, debate, the organic versus non-organic food? I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of organic foods. I think that there are some uh, wonderful points to be made about eating foods particularly vegetables that have been grown in uh, soil that hasn't been contaminated with all sorts of nasty fertilizers and uh, other uh, bizarre and potentially toxic chemicals. Having said that, this is not a eating program of exclusivity in that if you can't afford or find organic, you're still better off eating plants and animals rather than candy and sugar and grains and, and all this other stuff. So there's a, we, we have a spectrum of best choices to, well, not so good choices. And organic would certainly be at the high end of the spectrum. If you can get organic, by all means do. But if you can't get organic, then don't let that be a stopping point for you. Okay. And then also another little debate that a lot of longevity members have had in the past is coconut oil versus olive oil. And a lot of people do enjoy the coconut oil. A lot of primal and paleo uh, lifestyle people do really enjoy the coconut oil. I see it was in your resource page, you know, Tropical Traditions. They sell a lot of coconut products. But a lot of people uh, lean on the fact that olive oil has a much longer and safer research history. And coconut oil seems to be a little bit more recent on the scene. Doesn't have a lot of good research data behind it. What do you think? I think coconut oil has a, has a tremendous amount of good research behind it. And I think that it's really only recently that all this good research has come to light for coconut oil. And I think that in many regards, the more recent research is the more relevant research as we look into the effects that certain foods have at the level of gene expression. We're, we're finding, at least in my experience, that even the most staid and dogmatic and conservative organization having to do with nutrition in the, in the world the, the American Dietetic Association, many uh, registered dietitians are starting to appreciate the fact that coconut oil is probably a really good, healthy oil. I mean, those of us in the paleo and primal and ancestral communities think of, of coconut oil as the, as the elixir of the gods. And having said that, I certainly don't feel negatively in any way toward olive oil. I, I would encourage people to include both in there. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I you know, I enjoy both as well, but I, and I really like coconut oil for a lot of different recipes. Uh, you know, I like the flavor, but you know, some people had argued that perhaps it wasn't as healthy because it didn't have as much research, but your point is the most recent research has shown that coconut oil probably is quite healthy. Absolutely. Okay. And then I wanted to ask about what uh, is the most interesting research trend in nutrition that you have read or encountered in the last couple of months or maybe in the past year? Oh, wow. That's, um, that's one I'd have to think about okay. a little bit. I mean, you know, I, I'm always looking for the, the research that looks at uh, confirming that the low-carb eating strategy is the way to go and that um, anything that confirms that saturated fats are not bad for us, and there's a lot of that recent research, and anything that confirms that if we can dramatically reduce our glucose load by reducing the amount of carbohydrate, that that benefits us. Okay. Uh, and I do think we're seeing more of that. All right. Well, and then what about exercise? Uh, any new trends in exercise that can help people uh, stay on a, a better routine? Anything that you've seen or read recently about uh, the best forms of exercise? Well, I, the recent research confirms that it is, rather than the chronic cardio where you go out and you do the same slogging workout five or six times a week for 45 minutes or an hour tends to not have the benefits that we thought it might have. Meanwhile, we're seeing that brief bursts of exercise, we call it interval training, high-intensity interval training, uh, which take less time, which involve running the heart rate up to a max for anywhere from eight seconds to 40 seconds, and then resting for a few minutes and then doing it again, that those intermittent uh, interval training sessions, maybe once or at most twice a week, have far more benefit. And I think this is great news for people who are otherwise thinking, well, if I can't get to the gym and get on the treadmill, you know, the day is a waste. Oh, okay. Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, obviously, uh, you look quite healthy, and I was wondering if you have ever measured your aging biomarkers, or do you just kind of go by the feel of it? Well, I'm not a big, personally not a big believer in measuring, for instance, telomere length, which is the, one of the new biomarker uh, it is, strategies, yeah. mm-hmm. just because there are so many other factors involved, uh, telomerase and other elements that I think make the data irrelevant at best, and, and I think uh, dangerous in some cases where people might get a biomarker, an aging biomarker, and then all of a sudden start to, start to you know, feel like, oh my goodness, I've, uh, I've been going down the wrong path, and it has maybe nothing to do with, with their choices. So I'm, I, I really kind of go on um, how I feel, my energy levels, my body fat, how my genes fit, okay. so, how well I'm sleeping. Those are, in my estimation, the real markers of uh, and I'm, again, aging for me is more about how do I feel today, and and am I you know trending toward being uh, healthy and feeling this energetic well into the future. I'm not really thinking so much about do I want to do today what I need to do to live to 80 or 85. I want to do today what I what is going to give me the most energy today and the most enjoyment out of life today. Okay, and on that same line of thought, uh, through your public seminars, your books, and your blog, you have helped untold numbers of people achieve optimum health, feeling great about themselves and, and about their lifestyle. But uh, what about the next level? Uh, what do you think about life extension and possible rejuvenation therapies that uh, will come available in the near future? Um, you know, I'm all for a strategy that will, again, enhance my life. Having just said that I'm all about having fun today, I'm certainly not you know, making a, a Faustian uh, deal here to only enjoy today. I certainly do want to extend my life as long as possible. In fact, at my company, we have a, we have a motto, and it's live long, drop dead, which basically means to live as long as you can and be as active as you can, and then when it's time to go, don't prolong the end. You know, don't just, prolong uh, the agony if uh, that's happening. Exactly. Don't that's prolong the agony. So, to, again, to that end, I'm, I'm all for looking at ways to extending life as long as I get a high quality of life with it. Right. Okay. If, if, and if you were going to fund some new study uh, in the realm of diet or exercise, nutrition, uh, what would it be? What, what do you really want to know about the uh, you know, aging process? You know what's funny is that I, I don't. There's nothing I really want to know because I feel intuitively like I do know. So I guess if I were to fund a study, it would be to prove empirically what I already know, okay. which is that the primal blueprint way of eating is an ideal strategy for achieving your your ideal body composition, the maximum amount of energy, uh, reducing your risk for degenerative diseases, and increasing fertility, and all of the things that I think people are looking for in their lives. All right, and then uh, just a little fun question here as we get close to the end of the podcast. Of, of all the non-primal things that somehow work their way into your lifestyle, what do you indulge in that most people might find surprising? Well, every once in a while, I will break down and have a bowl of Ben & Jerry's Cherry Garcia ice cream with a little bit of creme de cassis on it. That, to me, is the absolute most decadent thing I could think of. I mean, that's almost worse than shooting heroin, but, <laughs> um, but that is my once in a while indulgence. And by the way, when I do that, every time about three hours later, I regret having done it because that four minutes of gustatory pleasure is then superseded by four or five hours of, uh, you know, increased heart rate, and right. sweating, uh, inability to sleep. Well, I find the same thing. I, I, I'll eat a, a high GI carb, uh, you know, dessert like uh, ice cream, or I might have some pancakes or something like that. After eating uh, not many carbs for so long, uh, it really has a noticeable effect. I'm amazed by that. Yeah, and you'd think we'd know better, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to enjoy things once in a while, right? And that's my point. Sure. That is my point, yeah. yeah. Uh, before we go, is there anything you'd like to uh, promote? Any new books of yours coming out or any seminars uh, that you might be attending or speaking? Well, yeah, I mean, I just always send people to my blog, MarksDailyApple.com. We have the books there, the seminars. It's a daily resource for people, and I encourage people to, uh, if they haven't tried the Primal Blueprint, to give it a 30-day trial. All right, well, thanks so much for joining us today, Mark. Thank you, Justin. Have a great day. You too. Bye. And there you go. Another interesting broadcast about diet and lifestyle choices. 
The primal blueprint or the paleo-style diet might not be for everyone because of genetic differences or moral concerns, but if you check out Mark's blog, you'll also find some thoughts about variations on the primal theme. Vegetarians and vegans can still benefit from some of the advice, like avoiding high GI carbs and supplementing correctly. Overall, I'm just glad to see someone like Mark with a large audience helping people stay healthy and ward off the ravages of aging. Until next time, I'm Justin Lowe.